Hey there! Hello and welcome back to Biopandit, your one-stop comprehensive bioinformatics training platform. I am delighted to introduce myself as sort of your very own Mahapandit. And today I am going to talk about an Finson experiment. Before I go into the details of the topic, first let me give you a brief introduction. See that protein folding follows the same physical principle as micelle formation by amphilytic molecules. In micelle formation, the hydrophobic side chains cluster together to maximize the entropic gain and the polar head groups face the ball quarter to maximize the enthalpic gain. Protein folding is driven by hydrophobic forces. If you look into any protein sequence, you will find at least three types of amino acids hydrophobic, polar, and charged. When an unfolded polypeptide chain is added to order, hydrophobic forces drive the hydrophobic amino acids to form clusters. This cluster formation of hydrophobic amino acids maximizes the entropic gain by releasing the maximum possible number of water molecules to bulk water. On the other hand, polar and charged amino acids tend to remain at protein surface and face the bulk water. Hydrogen bonding interactions between polar and charged amino acids and water molecules maximizes the enthalpic gain. Together, the enthalpic and the entropic gains make folding a spontaneous reaction. Remember guys that just like hydrophobic forces favor a folded state, there are also forces within protein that do not favor a folded state. The charge-charge, polar-polar and charge-polar interactions among the charged and polar amino acids disfavor the folding process. So, in order to fold, the favorable hydrophobic interactions of the hydrophobic amino acids must overcome the unfavorable charge-charge, polar-polar and charge-polar interactions of the polar and charged amino acids so that the net del G of the folded state becomes slightly lower than the del G of the unfolded state. If this happens, the folding reaction is spontaneous and its reverse reaction which is unfolding is not spontaneous. So you see guys, it is the protein sequence that determines whether the protein will be able to fold at all. Actually guys, it's more than that. Protein sequences contain all the information necessary for their folding. This was first experimentally demonstrated by Christian B. Anfinsen and his colleagues in 1973. Anfinsen and his co-workers performed a simple experiment. They first purified ribonuclease A protein. This protein has a single polypeptide chain of 124 amino acids and it is organized into its final shape by the formation of four disulfide bonds that you can see in the video on the left. These bonds are the major factor that determines what shape the ribonuclease protein will assume. Now you must remember that this beautiful structure was not known in 1973 and structure determining methods like X-ray crystallography, NMR spectroscopy were not only very difficult but also very expensive those days. So, Anfinsen has to use indirect evidences that the protein is fully folded and functional. How did he do it? Simple. He measured the activity of the purified protein to catalyze the hydrolysis of RNA. The second step was to add urea and beta mercaptoethanol. Urea denatures a folded protein by breaking the hydrogen bonds and beta mercaptoethanol reduces the disulfide bonds. These two reagents efficiently denatured the ribonuclease A protein completely. And Finsen confirmed that the protein has been denatured by showing that at this stage, the chemical activity of the protein is negligible. Having succeeded in obtaining the unfolded protein, Anfinsen now studied the process of refolding by removing the denaturing agents. There are 105 different ways to pair 8 cysteine residues into 4 disulfide bonds and only one combination can generate the native active ribonucleus protein. So, if the information that determines protein shape is inherent to the amino acid sequence, 
then the unfolded polypeptide should be able to refold into the native structure. In this case, the full enzymatic activity will be restored. If the folding information is not in the amino acid sequence, then the refolding would be random and only a small fraction of the refolded molecules that is 1 divided by 105 would have the native structure. In this case, obviously, the observed enzymatic activity will be much smaller than that at step 1. So, what did Anfinsen observe? He observed that the ribonuclease protein slowly regained its full enzymatic activity. This could mean only one thing. All the molecules of the ribonuclease protein have refolded into the catalytically active native structure. So guys, this experiment without any doubt proved that protein sequences contain all the information necessary for their folding. This experiment has been repeated on many proteins since 1973, yielding similar results. But remember guys, this method has a limitation. This method is only applicable for proteins that can fold into their native structure spontaneously. There are exceptions and there are many, many, many exceptions. Large proteins, proteins with multiple domains, often misfold into non-native structures. Such misfolding can be very dangerous and cause diseases. You want an example? I have three. Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and diabetes. This is why chaperon protein families are there in our cells to assist protein folding mechanism. So, let us finish our discussion here guys. See you soon.